This morning, we are going to look at Psalm 23. So if you have a Bible or you have a device, Psalm 23 is where we're going to spend the morning. I think Psalm 23 is such a, a great passage, and it's a pity that we seem to only use it at funerals. Uh, you know, every time there's a funeral, someone reads Psalm 23, uh, or someone's going through a devastating time, then we read Psalm 23. But Psalm 23 is much more than that. There is so much good stuff in Psalm 23. So we're going to look at it. Initially, it was I was going to try and knock it all out this morning, but in the preparation, I just felt we're going to do some of it today, and, and we'll carry on after that. So ta- Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures, and he leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely, Your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We'll work our way through, going from verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. It's a bit of a challenge that verse. I mean, David needed probably a lot of things he would have liked, but he says, you know what, I I, I lack nothing. Can we say that we lack nothing? Because if we can't, we've got to ask the question, is the Lord really my shepherd? Am I allowing him to truly shepherd me? Because sometimes there's things we want, yeah, but the things we need, the Lord takes care. He's our provider. He, he, he provides the things we need to do what he's called us to. So we feel like we're, we're lacking. And we're going to ask, am I allowing the Lord to shepherd me, to lead me, to guide me? To do all the other things in this verse. You know, sometimes I think we get so busy, we lose sight of what Jesus is doing, and we start to focus on other things. I think focus has come up a couple of times in the last few weeks. What are we focusing on? You know, sometimes we get so caught up in what we think the Lord should be doing, or what we think he's not doing, that we don't look at what he is actually doing. Lord, what is it you're doing? And let's give our attention to that. So if we lose sight of Jesus, our focus is going to drift. And it's hard to follow the shepherd when we're not looking at the shepherd. It's hard to to, to, to hear his voice if we're not listening for his voice. Because he's speaking. So are we listening to the shepherd? Are we allowing him to actually shepherd us? I think sometimes we want to rush uh, past the shepherding and just jump into the results. Say, I want these things, I want this, I want that, I want the refreshing, I want the good stuff, uh, I want the provision, I want all of this. But we bypass the shepherding part. We say, the Lord's my shepherd. Because he's my shepherd, I lack nothing. Psalm 37 says, commit your ways to the Lord, trust in him, and he will do this with a colon. 
These things is what he's going to do if you commit your ways to the Lord and trust Him. He will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn. Your vindication will be like the noonday sun. You're like, yeah, I want that. I want that vindication. I want that shiny reward. But we forget that that is coming after we've committed our ways to the Lord and trusted Him. Commit your ways and trust Him, and then this is what happens. You see, sometimes we want to skip to this is what happens without letting Him lead us and guide us. We want the victories. We want the good stuff. But sometimes we skip the before the good stuff part of the verse. The Lord is my shepherd. We need to let Him shepherd us. To have him as your shepherd means you're spending time with him. He says in John 10, the sheep know my voice. Why do they know his voice? Because they're hearing it often on a regular basis. Are we spending time with him? It's hard for him to lead and guide us if we're not listening. Taking the time to to be with Him, to, to ask Him, to, to hear what He has to say on things. Instead of making decisions and then just hoping God's in this decision with me. Like, uh, we hear that a lot. Well, this is what I'm doing and, I, and I'm just going to hope God's in it. Well, why don't you actually ask Him first? Which of these options are you in? Uh, which one should I take? And then you can take the option knowing that he's in it, not just hoping that he's in it. Are you trusting him as uh, to, to provide and to protect you? That's what a shepherd does. Protects the sheep. That's why he has a rod to beat away other animals that come and want to eat the sheep. Do we trust him to protect us? and to look after us, and to provide for us. Or again, as we said last week, is he more just the safety net when we can't do it ourselves? All through David's highs and his lows, he rests on a couple of things. One, the Lord is my shepherd. For all the things he's learned, his ups, his downs, the Lord is my shepherd. And it doesn't matter how dark the valley gets, the Lord is my shepherd. Even in the good, the nice pastures, the Lord is my shepherd. In the good times and the bad times, the Lord is still my shepherd. I think sometimes we lean on him in the dark valleys, and then when we're in the green pastures, we're like, we're okay. We're good, Lord. We'll sort ourselves out from here. No. Psalm 27, he says, man, out of all the things I want to do, I've only got one thing I ask of the Lord, and that is just to dwell in his presence and gaze at his beauty. It's like the Lord's my shepherd, and all I actually want to do is just sit in His presence and gaze at His beauty. When's the last time we took time to just sit and listen to the Lord, sit in His presence, and said, Lord, you speak if you want to speak. I'm just going to sit here and listen for your voice. Verse 2 to 3 says, He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for His name's sake. So He takes us to green pastures to lay down. Let's not get them the wrong way around and lay down in the valleys and pass through the pastures. 
If you're in the dog valley, keep moving. Yeah, you find yourself in a tough spot, keep moving. doesn't make us lie down there. We, he wants us to go through there. Where he wants us to sit down and stop and, and take a breath is in the green pastures. He takes us to pastures, S, plural. So we're always moving on. We get here, we stop at the pasture, we, re, we, we relax, we get refreshed, and then we move on to the next one. There's always something more He's got for us. There's always more places He's wanting to take us. We're all called to be pioneers, not settlers. He's always wanting to move us on and move us on. So just because we're in a pasture doesn't mean we stay there. Because we will stagnate right there. He's always wanting us to move on to the next. But he takes us down to these pastures. And when he takes us there, we need to get as much out of it as we can get out of it. He takes us there because we need to rest. We need to recover. We need to build our strength up for what's coming. He leads us and He guides us. You know, some good news is the Lord is never lost. Uh, sometimes we may wonder what's going on, but He knows. He may not lay the whole plan out for you and say, this is where we're going. Here's the map. Uh, off you go. You know, when back when we yeah, did, did a military service way back, we didn't have GPS. In those days, yes, I am older than I look. So we would sit at the base, and we'd be told, this is where we're going, and there's a big map. And then you had to memorize your route. You can't take that map with you. You can take a compass with you. Yeah, yeah, no, no issues there. But you sit there, and you've got to plot your course out in the office, and then... Off you go. Now, when you're on the road 18 hours later and you're still trying to remember, it's not always that easy. But the Lord doesn't always lay it out for us, a big map on the wall saying, here's where you are and here's where we're going to. He's saying, come, let's walk together. Let's go step by step. And as we go, I'm going to show you the next step and I'm going to show you the next step. But He's going to lead us and guide us, and no matter what's going on, if we're trusting in Him, staying with where He's going, we can remember He's not lost. So we're doing all right. But you know what? He does the whole route with us. He doesn't say, all right, I'm going to catch you on the other side. No, He's with us all the way. You're in that darkest valley, He's right there with you. Leading you and guiding you through that valley. You're in the pastures. He's leading and guiding you there too. Hey, here's a nice spot for you to hang out. Here's what you need out of the pasture. The more we lean on Him and trust Him to guide us and to lead us, the more often we're going to find ourselves making better decisions and better choices. The more we ask Him before we make the decisions. Sometimes He's going to lead us and guide us and we're going to make good decisions and we're only going to find out later, oh man, thank goodness I made that decision in the right way. I didn't even think it was a big decision, but I'm glad I, would, I chose what I chose. Because look now. Trust Him all the time to continue to lead us and to guide us. He wants you to make good calls, and so He's going to help you to make good calls. And as we read there, He restores or refreshes our souls. The question is, there are there areas in your life or in your heart 
that are devastated, broken, or hurt. Because he wants to heal them. He wants to make your heart whole and healthy again. Someone once said, I don't know who it was, so if you like it, just you heard it from me, right? So I heard Brendan say this. I don't know who said it, but I thought it's good. To serve God wholeheartedly, you must first allow Him to make your heart whole. We need to let Him come and make our hearts whole again. I know there's lots of snappy sayings along these lines, but we need to know this. You may be good at hiding those hurts and those things away from the rest of us, but you are not hiding them away from Him. He knows them, he sees them, and he wants to heal them because he doesn't want you running around with that hurt and with that pain. He wants you to be whole, refreshed, and healthy. I was sitting at one point this week and uh, just counting the uh, amazing amount of uh, rugby injuries the club has had this year. And uh, it's, 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 it's quite an interesting list. Somebody, I'll, I'll just give you an, an insight into our rugby season. It's a good one. We've, we're actually in the final next weekend, by the way. So one of the guys cracked a rib out for a couple of weeks. Uh, so guy damaged ligaments in his back. He's, he's out for the season. Uh, two people damaged knee ligaments. One of them is still trying to play with a knee brace on. Uh, somebody tore a rotator cuff is going in for surgery next month. One guy broke a nose. One girl broke three ribs and punctured a lung. Two people being concussed. Someone broke a hand. When I say broke a hand, they broke two bones in their hand. Now they've got these pins sticking out their hand. And then they've got to go and have surgery again to have those pins apparently replaced by other pins. And they broke their hand earlier in the game, but they were still enjoying the game that much. They finished the game first and then went to hospital. Someone broke an ankle. Someone had their teeth knocked loose, like blood was pouring out. Now they had to have them fixed in a root canal done uh, because the one tooth died. Uh, <laughs> another person broke, uh, uh, tore their bicep. So they also out for the season and had surgery. Now, they were all doing, or got these injuries, doing something they love to do. And they all can't wait to get back on the field again. They're missing it. They still come out to practice. Even though they can't run around or catch a ball because their hand is all, you know. They did it doing something they love. And they can't wait to get back to it. Most of them have to take time to heal. Because they can't play properly with those injuries. And some of them, I have to tell them, you are not permitted to play. <laughs> but I want to. No, you can't because you're a, a danger to yourself playing like this. All right? So the reason I say this is because some of the hurts and pains that we've picked up and we're carrying, some of those were even doing things that we love doing. And sometimes it's when you're doing something that you love, you, you're more vulnerable to a criticism coming in. And that it seems to hit a lot harder than something else. Because you've put your heart and your soul into it. And then you hear something, and it just cuts. And it cuts deeper than what you thought. It's because you were vulnerable, but you were doing something you loved. And, you were, and if it was for the Lord, I can be sure you were pouring out your heart into that thing. And then you got cut. 
whatever it is that caused your hurt, you need to get it healed because you can't do the things God called you to do at 100% carrying that injury. And maybe for this morning, for some of you, God is saying, you have to get this injury taken care of before you can get into other things I have in store for you. Because if you don't, that thing is going to keep pulling you back. It's going to keep hindering you from walking in the things that he's got for you. You can't give 100% at everything with those internal hurts and injuries. Sometimes you can't even give 100% to your spouse, to your family, to your kids. Because you're too busy guarding or trying to protect this hurt that's there. I think there's just too many people walking around with these hurts. And because it's easy to hide from everybody else, we get away with it. But God sees. And He doesn't want you walking around like that. He wants you set free from that. You may have been hurt doing something you love. You may have been hurt in the battlefield. You went through the dog valley, and then that dog valley battlefield, you came out with a, a few wounds. He wants to fix them. He wants to heal them. You may have been hurt by somebody who doesn't even know that they hurt you in that way. They said something, and you took a, a hit, and... They don't even know that. By the way, we need to get it healed. Ministry for each other, for our families, for our spouses. We need to get that healed for our walk with the Lord. We want to get it healed. And as a church, we often talk about Isaiah 61, because the Lord has spoken it over the church so many times, especially verses 1 to 3. It says, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. And provide for those who grieve in Zion. To bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes. The oil of joy instead of mourning. And a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. It's hard for us to go about telling people to come here and get all of this when we ourselves are walking with these injuries. Come here. The Lord's going to help bind up your broken heart. But our hearts are broken. Come here, the Lord's going to take off that despair and He's going to give you praise. But we ourselves are walking around with despair. The Lord's declared freedom for the captives, but we ourselves are still lying captive to things. Comfort those who mourn. What if we're still mourning? Mourning, I know we think, oh man, because somebody uh, passed away. But you could be mourning the end of a relationship. You could be mourning a season that you were in. Moving from one place to another. One I felt particularly was a ministry you love. But believe you can now no longer do. God wants to come and bring crowns of beauty and oil of joy and garments of praise. He wants to come and bring restoration. Jesus came to save us and to set us free. I don't know if you've ever seen those things. They sometimes have at uh, fairs where it's like an inf 
you know, like the jumping castle, but it's like the long alleyway. So, and then you tie a bungee cord to, to your uh, harness, and then you run down this lane as far as you can and uh, as hard as you can to see how far you can get before that bungee cord rips you right back again. And I think sometimes these hurts that nobody else can see are like those bungee cords. We go running towards something new, and then that thing comes and pulls us right back to where we were again. Let God come and bring some healing this morning. Remove those bungee cords. Lamentations 1.16 says, This is why I weep, and my eyes overflow with tears. No one is near to comfort me. No one to restore my spirit. The Lord is here to comfort you and to restore your spirit. Psalm 37, 7 and 8 says, I will be glad and rejoice in your name. For you saw my affliction. You knew the anguish of my soul. You have not given me into the hands of my enemy, but have set my feet in a spacious place. Psalm 34, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted, and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. Uh, Luke 17 for me is, is, is uh, uh, an account of, of, of a miracle Jesus did that it's probably one of my favorites, all right? I know all Scripture is great and all miracles are miracles, but, but there's, some, there's an aspect to this one that, I, that makes me sit back and go, wow. And that's in Luke 7, where Jesus and his crew were, were arriving at a city. And as they were arriving at the city, a widow came out, and uh, they were taking her uh, only son who had died. And they were taking him out to go and bury him or whatever they were going to go and do with him. But anyway, so as they're walking, it says Jesus saw her and he felt compassion for her. And then he went and raised the son from the dead and said, there you go. Nobody asked him to do anything. Jesus just saw the widow and he felt compassion for her. He saw the anguish. He saw the emotional condition. And his heart went out for her. He felt, oh, I, I, I've got to do something. And sometimes the, we think we've got to earn it or qualify for it. You know what? Just because he loves you, he wants to do something for you. He wants to bring that healing. He wants to bring that refreshing, that restoration, just because he loves you. I mean, th these, this lady didn't even know who he was. After he left, they said, who is this guy? He still didn't even tell them, hey, I'm Jesus, I'm this, I'm that. No, he just, man, lady, I, I feel for you. I'm going to do something for you. Share that passage, but I want to share a couple of other things just to show, hopefully, that Jesus cares about the condition of your heart. He cares about your emotional well-being. He cares about your mental well-being. There was a, a lady in Zimbabwe. Uh, we were doing some ministry there, and she said, please, can you guys come and pray for my mother? She lives in complete fear. She d can't sleep in a room by herself. She comes and sleeps in, in our rooms because she, she can't be by herself. She says things come and, uh, like evil things come and, and, and torment her if she's in a room by herself. And uh, she says, but she may not be keen to see you guys because in, in, in uh, man, a lot in Southern Africa, but even through there's these groups, call, they call themselves the apostles, but they're terrible guys. 
Anyway, they told her that if a Christian or a pastor ever comes here, you better, it's bad for you. So she was scared that we were there. And so we just sat around a table like we're having coffee. And of course, she didn't understand. And so we prayed for her, but we prayed for her and, and made it look like we're just having conversation. But we're praying, Lord, you know, please set this lady free from this, please. But we were like we were talking. So we were praying because otherwise she would have bolted. Because now these other guys have put stories in their head. So anyway, we went back a couple of months later, and that lady said, man, I've got to tell you guys what happened. My mother went to my sister's place because it was time to do the threshing of the wheat, and so she wanted to help them with that. And uh, she went out for a walk, and then she didn't come back to the next day. So we were all freaking out about it because she can't sleep alone. And we were panicked. But what happened? The next day, some guy brought her back, and then she told us the story. She said she went, she went, she wanted to go and sit on the mountain and be by herself just to rest. And while she was walking, she got scared. And when she got scared, she was going to turn back. And then she said it was like an angel was there and said, don't be afraid. I'm the one that those guys were praying about and talking about in that living room. Don't be afraid. I'm with you. And so she carried on walking. And she got to the top of the mountain, and she was so enjoying it there. She overnighted there by herself. Some other guy had come. And, and, and spoken to her, said, oh, you're right. Don't you want me to take you back down? And she says, no, I'm fine. The Lord is with me. His angel is with me. She came back the next day, told them all about it. She's, uh, the, the mom is, 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 is clearly saved now. And it's like, uh, I can't wait to tell everybody else about this. Uh, the rest of the family who weren't believers are now believers because they can't deny what they saw. This lady that was so gripped with fear, completely released from that. There was a, a lady at the uh, equip in Nanaimo a few years ago. And, uh, and I, don't, I, I don't remember praying for the lady, but apparently I prayed for her. And then about six months later, we were somewhere else, I think at the uh, equip in Toronto. And she came and said, I must tell you something. You prayed for me at the West Equip. I said, oh, okay. She said, I've been on a whole whack of meds. And since she prayed for me, I've whittled them down to hardly anything. Now. Like for a mental well-being. So my first thing was, uh-oh. <laughs> Did you talk to somebody about this, you know? Have you worked this through? She's like, yeah, I worked it through with, with my doctor and with my elders. And everybody's keeping tab on me, and I've never felt better. She said, but, you know, so I asked the, el the elders of the church that she's in, what happened? They said, you know, she had this really intense, catastrophic event happen in her life. And she was never the same after that. It was, a, it was an emotional thing that broke her heart completely that she couldn't pull herself back together again. And that led to doctors putting her on all these other meds to help her function again. And they said, since then, God brought healing. And she's reduced all the meds, and we're all keeping an eye on her, and her doctor's keeping track of her as well. And she's 100%. I always get nervous because sometimes people quit those things and you shouldn't quit those things. Uh, but she's doing well and she's functioning well and she's doing 100% and she's never felt better. So I'll share this with you in, in a hope that they build faith and stir faith in you that God cares and He can heal those things. He can repair, He can restore, and He can 
refresh. For some, it's an instant setting free. For some, it's like pulling a thorn out. It still hurts for a little bit, but it, it goes away and is like nothing ever happened. So I'm not saying it's going to be 100% this way. God does what he wants to do, how he wants to do it. He's sovereign. But what I do want to do is give an opportunity this morning for you to say, God, I need this. I need this refreshing. I you know in the pre-service prayer, read the scripture out of Acts 3, repent so that times of refreshing may come. So if there's something that you know you need to repent of, do that so that the times of refreshing can come. And if you're not sure, the Holy Spirit will remind you. If He's not reminding you, all right. And just ask Him for the refreshing to come. But if there's something that's happened that's caused that hurt and that pain, I just want to encourage you this morning. Say, Lord, you come. And bring the refreshing. And bring the healing. And bring the restoration. Let Him come and fill you with peace as he takes you to the quiet waters at the pasture. Allow him to heal those cuts, those wounds, those bruises. Just as, we, just as we're stilling ourselves in his presence, yesterday I had the scripture on my heart where David prayed, Lord, give me an undivided heart that I might fear your name, that I might revere your name. And I even have a sense that in terms of an undivided heart, there's some that there's been one room that's been closed up and that's where my pain is or that where, that's where my hurt is or that's where the thing that is icky to me is. And I've kept it all closed because I haven't really wanted to look at it. And I don't think God has wanted to look at it. And, and so that's, my, my heart is open, but that's the one closed room. And I just feel the Holy Spirit is just saying this morning, you can trust Him. It's not for you to fix by yourself. It's not for you to nurse by yourself. Just open that door of that room. Allow Jesus in and allow him to bring his healing. Because he's wanting you to have an undivided heart, an undivided whole heart, as Brendan said.